Raise your hand if you come to work and you feel like you're a rock star. Oh, <laughs> I hear some giggle and some like, <laughs> it's okay if you're proud of it. Now raise your hand if you want to come to work and feel like you're a rock star. Woo, that should be everybody in the room, right? Turn to your neighbor, give them a high five and say, you're a rock star. <laughs> You can do your other neighbor front and back too. Uh, <laughs> lots of laughter and joy. Hi everyone, my name is Simone Salim and I am so excited to be here. I am a triple bear. What does that mean? I came here for undergrad law school and I also worked at the law school as the director of employer outreach and associate director for private sector counseling and programs. And it's just always exciting to come back, feel your energy and have a chance to give back. Welcome to Turn your imposter syndrome into a champion mindset. How many of you know what the imposter syndrome is? Ooh, that is a lot of people. This should be a good, fun, interesting discussion. Um, before we delve into the imposter syndrome and how to kick it to the curb and turn it into a champion mindset, is it okay if I share a little bit about myself and how I became passionate about this topic? Thank you, lots of head nods. So today, I wake up super passionate and excited to be able to come and help people like yourselves and other people that I've worked with over the years on recognizing what the imposter syndrome is, how it's impacted their careers and held them back, and how they can work on managing it so that they can propel and excel, and not only that, be able to give back in a full, good way where they can live a good life. Um, I am the founder and creative joy director of Career Unicorns, and our goal is a lot like Mari Kondo. Who knows who Mari Kondo is? Yay, lots of tidying people. So what we do is we help people tidy up their careers so that they can come to their careers with joy and be able to spread that joy and do more of what you love, have the career that you dream of, and also be able to live the life that you want. Because everybody spends so much time at work. You want to come to work feeling happy, right? Who agrees with that? Raise your hand. Awesome. That's like the whole room. Amazing. Um, but it wasn't always this way. Growing up, I grew up in a refugee community. Uh, my parents are refugees from Laos, and I grew up with people where we were pegged to be, you know, high school dropouts, teenage moms told, you know, why bother trying? You're not going to get very far. And when you hear those kinds of messages, it really gets to you. Who here uh, can relate to hearing those kinds of messages growing up? Yeah, a lot of you in this room can, can hear that. And the thing is, those kinds of messages, they never leave you, right? They kind of are always there in the background. I see a lot of head nods. Um, so even though I was, quote unquote, one of the lucky few, and we'll talk a little bit about luck and, and what that has to do with imposter syndrome, uh, who got out and who was able to go to a good college like Berkeley, uh, be able to go to a good law school like Berkeley, work at a top 10 law firm, have a Google Talk, work with over 1,000 clients now to help them succeed in their careers, whether it's finding their dream jobs, getting a raise or promotion, developing leadership skills, or building a book of business, in the back of my mind, I'm always like, ooh, if they find out who I really am, they're going to can me. You know, I don't, I don't really belong here. Uh, you know, I just got here by luck. Um, and it, if this keeps going on, it's going to be bad. It's going to be really bad if they know who I am. Who can relate to that? Yeah, that's like the majority of the room. The interesting thing is that when I was going through this, I thought, it must just be me. I must be the only person who is a fraud in the room and who is completely freaked out. But in fact, what studies show is that 70% of people will have at least one episode of imposter syndrome. So at least 70% of you, possibly in this room, or people that you know are gonna experience imposter syndrome. And these kinds of things really have a negative impact on you because there are many times in my own life and in my clients' lives where I've seen that they've been given an opportunity and they've said, you know what, no, I don't, I don't think that's quite right for me. Or um, they get so stressed out that they're procrastinating or they get to the other extreme where they're so stressed out that they're burning themselves out. And um, I'm happy to share that through the work that I've done with my own clients and through a proven step strategy system that I've developed to help myself and my clients, we've been able to help people to not only recognize imposter syndrome, but to be able to see how it's impacted their lives and what they can do in their power to manage this process. Who here is excited about learning about how to manage this process? Yay, 
Okay, woo, I see a lot of hands. Thank you so much. Um, so I wanna go over the program agenda. That's a little bit about myself, but we've talked a little bit about that. Um, and in terms of the program agenda, we we're gonna talk about the definition of imposter syndrome, common thoughts around imposter syndrome, the impact imposter syndrome has on your careers, how to kick the imposter syndrome to the curb, how to build your champion mindset, and how to connect with your true desires and questions along the way. If you have questions or comments along the way, please do engage because the more energy you give me, the more energy I can give you. And also, you know, this is really about you taking this experience and making it your own. Um, I also want to take a quick chance to thank the University of California, Berkeley, for hosting this amazing event for you because it's a lot of work. Um, the planning committee, including Terry Moore and people on the team, to make this all happen. I, I think there was a lottery and there were over five or 700 of you that are here. It's a lot to put this all together. And last but not least, to thank you for making the commitment to come here, to show up, and to give it to your all to be here because this is really truly about your career and how to advance yourself. So give yourselves a round of applause. So when I asked earlier who is familiar with imposter syndrome, let's see those hands again. It's like almost the whole room, that's great. So what, are, what, what, what do you think imposter syndrome is? Oh, the hands just went down. <laughs> uh, when you get a call back and actually get an offer, you said, really call me back? And so first day of work, you just know you're fraud. And you say, how can I face this until I can convince myself and others that I'm not yeah, thank you for that, Peter. I'm going to repeat back what Peter said because they're recording it and I'm told I have to repeat this back. But essentially, what Peter said is that, you know, it's this idea that you get a call back and you get an offer and you think, how did I get that? I'm a fraud and how am I going to fake until I make it on the first day of work? Who can relate to that? And that's like over half the room. Any other thoughts around the definition of imposter syndrome? Yes, in the back. tells you somehow you don't belong in a room or in a specific setting or... I'm going to move down. Get closer. Yeah. Uh, that you, you know, somehow that you don't belong. Right. Um, when, in fact, because of your credentials and, uh, you know, whatever expertise you may have, you actually do, but your inner self doesn't allow you to recognize that. Yeah. What was your name again? Frida. Frida. So as Frida said, it's this idea, the sense that you don't belong, that um, even though you have qualifications and experience, you're still feeling like, you know what, this is not me and this is not my place. Who here can relate to that? Thank you for your candor and honesty. I love this group. Most, most corporate rooms I go to, everybody's like, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I saw some other hands. Yes. Mm -hmm. along the way. Yeah, and what was your name again? Ashley. Ashley. So Ashley said the fear of you being found out along the way. And what is it that you're afraid of being found out of? Oh gosh, that you're not actually qualified. <laughs> 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 she said, oh gosh, that you're not actually qualified. Who, who, who here can relate to that? Lots of hands. Not and then, worthy. You're not worthy, right. Yeah, and what was your name, sir? JD. JD. JD said you're not worthy. And you had a comment? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, so I, told, I think it's also that your background defines who you are in the workplace. So mm. you know your authentic self, but the limitations in place by colonialism define if I'm like whatever, person of color or, you know, gender, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that that's going to be an obstacle. So therefore, it's that noise in your head. It's like, oh, this is someone or I'm someone that's typically not supposed to be here, mm -hmm. and I'm proud because of her, you know, that's why Yeah, so Miguel brought up a really interesting point, which is the intersectionality of gender, race, um, and other factors that might make you feel like, you know what, people who are here don't look like me, don't talk like me, um, and therefore I don't belong, and, I, and I'm not supposed to be here. Yeah, so the themes around belonging is really key. And there was a comment back there. What was your name again? So I'm, my name is Alcida. Alcida. And many years ago, my husband was the first one who brought this to my attention. And um, he said, and he was speaking about himself, we were talking, and he said <coughs> it felt as, he feels as if 
He's like in the Wizard of Oz. Mm. And he's the Oz. Oh. And so there is that time where you, you know, there's the perception that the Oz is this great, but then when you pull the curtains away, you see who you really are. And, and I was really hurt by that, because I was like, why do you think like that of yourself? Because you're this and you're that. And it reflects exactly to what that person just said before me. Because even though you know you have the qualification, you've taken the test, you've passed the test, you've proven yourself, when you get into the room as a person of color, then there's the doubt, because it comes from the doubt that the other folks in the room what's how they see you and what they project. And I'll give you a quick example. My husband is, um, he's a theologian. He walks into a board meeting and the majority of people at the board are white folks. And the chair is a white man. And he walks in and he comes in with, and this is a PhD, you know, well-educated. And he walks into the room and he has on his African attire and the chairperson says to him, Hey, George, I see you have on your pajamas. Oh, wow. So when you get that repetitiveness in different ways, different formats, and mm -hmm. then you start to feel like, am I really the odds? Am I really yeah. who I project to be? Thank and you, you so have to much fight for hard. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that, Althea. Um, and, and basically what Althea was talking about is this idea that, you know, you're in the Wizard of Oz and you open the curtains and you see your true self. Um, and I really appreciate you sharing that story about, you know, your husband who's educated going to this board meeting in his African attire and being told like, oh, you're here in your PJs because that is a lack of sensitivity. And I think what's really interesting in the comments that are being given uh, throughout is that there's this, um, this, this idea of not internalizing your success and this idea of feeling like you're, you don't belong. Um, and, and then what complicates that is the external factors, right? The, the things that, uh, uh, that are coming from outside sources too as well that are giving you these feedback, these loop, looping feedback that then creates the stories in your head. And we're gonna be addressing those things. So typically the definition of imposter syndrome, as many of you have discussed, is this feeling of inadequacy. Who can relate to that? Inadequacy, yeah. Feelings that your, your success is not deserved. Who can relate to that? Yeah, half the room. Um, success is due to chance or luck. Yeah, how many of you, when your boss says, great job, you're like, oh, I was just lucky. Or, you know what, it was the team. I, I didn't do anything, it's not a big deal, right? Yeah, lots of head nods, lots of hand raises. Um, and then despite uh, evidence of your skills and qualifications, you still don't truly believe here that you deserve to be here. And as um, several of you have said, uh, you think that, you know what, they're gonna find out who I really am and I'm a fraud and I don't belong. And interestingly, as I mentioned before, 70% of people will go through at least one episode of imposter syndrome in their lifetime, which means that the great majority of people in this room uh, will be experiencing that or the chances of you knowing somebody who's going through that is very, very, very high. So that's just something to keep in mind. Um, common thoughts around imposter syndrome includes, I must not fail. I feel like a fake, we've heard that many times. It's all down to luck and success is no big deal. So again, what it is is this idea that you cannot internalize your success despite your qualifications, despite real facts and evidence showing that you indeed are in fact supposed to be here. Yeah, any questions or comments about that? Yes. I'm gonna try to give you a mic, that way I don't have to repeat everything. Yeah. Can we pass this back to her? Yeah. Thanks. Um, I really relate to feeling like you can't fail, like you have to prove yourself and be 100% in order to get the same recognition as other people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how does that impact you? Uh, that it increases my stress at work and <laughs> <laughs> it Lots makes things a little bit more fraught than they probably need to be. I see. Yeah, and lots of head nods in the room too, so you're not alone. Yeah, I think there was another comment. Um, 
I did want to ask, and maybe it's the next slide, where it said, success is no big deal. Mm -hmm. I actually wanted to ask, um, what, maybe where does that come from? What, do, what does, what does, what do you mean by when you say that? Is that a, um, that's like, is that a, basically saying like, I, I'm not supposed to achieve or, I, that's, I guess the question, like, I, I do resonate with that, but I'm not sure if that's a, like, if that's saying I don't deserve to succeed or, oh, I'm just playing this down because I, I just got to do good enough. To yeah, pass. often what it, it relates to is this idea, um, and thanks for asking that question, Chris, uh, for the clarification is this idea that if you do succeed, you downplay it. And you say, like, it's not a big deal. It's really, you know, nothing. Um, it's due to luck. And so, again, not owning your own success or own achievements. And so it's going back to that idea of feeling like you're a fraud, you don't belong, you don't deserve. And Melissa, do you have a comment as well? So my question is, how do you define one episode of imposter syndrome? So you've said a couple <laughs> of times that 70% of humanity is going to have at least one episode in their life. I feel like this is, at minimum, a weekly occurrence for me. <laughs> so, like, what yeah. percentage have this as, like, a part of their life, like, almost every day? Yeah, I think that's, that's so fascinating to ask that question. Thank you for asking that question. Uh, that's, that research is done by psychologists, and that's what they came up with, is that at least... Um, people will experience this at least once in their life. 70% of people will. And, and what, what, what we really know, and, and, and what I know from working with clients, is it's actually like a lifetime thing, right? Because, because these thoughts and um, ideas are not just coming from nowhere. They're usually embedded at a really early age. Um, you're getting these messages at an early age that you don't belong, you're not worthy, you're a fraud. Um, if you succeed, it's not a big deal. And it could come from, you know, families. It could come from friends. Um, it could come from your your own insecurities. Um, and so, uh, so, so that's what makes it difficult, right? Is like how do you how do you manage all of it? Um, and and that's what we're going to spend some of the time that we have here, even though we only have a short amount of time because we only have an hour on on that particular issue, which is. Uh, how do we manage it successfully? Yeah. Any other questions before we move on? No? Thank you so much for being so active and engaged. This is really great. Um, so how does imposter syndrome impact your career? There's two major ways that imposter syndrome can impact your career. One is this feeling of unworthiness resulting in procrastination. Who has done this? Ah, that's like three-fourths of the room. Yes, <laughs> big hands back there. They're like jumping up. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I was working with a client. Um, she was a student uh, from China, and she uh, really wanted to look for opportunities in America. But she told herself, you know what, I'm not at the best university, and um, if I needed to find a job, I'm going to have to like, get a visa, and who's going to hire me anyways? This is in spite of her you know, being a speaker at a lot of national conferences and international conference. This is in spite of her graduating at the top of her class. This is in spite of her having really, really amazing internships that obviously would make her a great candidate. Um, and so what she would do is look at jobs. Like, that looks interesting. Oh, that looks interesting. That looks interesting. And then after a few hours, not apply. And then be depressed. And then the next day, she would wake up, do the same thing. Oh, huh, looks interesting. Looks interesting. Looks interesting. Not going to apply. Um, and a big reason is because she had this feeling of like she's a fraud and she doesn't deserve to be there. So why bother trying anyway? Who has experienced this or knows somebody who's experienced this in their time? Right. Yeah, majority of the room. The other way that imposter syndrome can impact your career is, um, you know, resulting in perfectionism. And I think somebody over here had mentioned that, right? You're fraught with a lot of stress. And what does that stress do? It makes you work, 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 and you feel like it's never enough. And you're beating yourself up if there's a little typo or, you know, things didn't go quite as well or somebody made a little off comment, right? I, I experienced this too. I'll go to a speaking engagement. I'll get like 98% good comments and there's that one person who like hates you, you know, and you're like, ah, <laughs> right? And that is the only thing you can focus on, right? And then you go down this downward spiral of like, oh my God, I'm never going to do this again, da, 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 da. Right? You're all laughing. Who, who has experienced that in their careers? Right? Majority of the room. So all this is to say is that like these feelings 
are not uncommon and that many of us are experiencing this. Um, and, and to take some comfort in that, what studies show is that you know, one of the ways in which we can help with imposter syndrome is to actually just acknowledge that it exists and that, it's, that you're not the only person experiencing that, that this is in some ways a universal problem that we're all experiencing. Um, kicking the imposter syndrome to the curb. Uh, so this is where we're gonna get into the meat of uh, the program, is to help you throughout to kind of think about, well, we know what imposter syndrome is. Seems like the majority of this room has experienced it or knows people who've experienced it. So how do we work through it? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of time to answer these questions. How has imposter syndrome held you or somebody you know back? Uh, what are the stories that you're telling yourself? Because the stories that you tell yourself is what's having power on you. And what would you do differently? So go ahead, take out your pens and paper. I know they gave you the, the little handy notebooks um, when you registered. Um, and spend a little bit of time answering these questions. So who would like to share to the larger group? Cla oh, yes. <coughs> Feel free to introduce yourself and to go ahead and make a comment. Yes. Is it on? No, how about now? OK. okay. Great. <laughs> so one of the things that I shared was um, being afraid of reading my uh, performance evaluation. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have the laughter in the room. Yeah. And uh, the last time that I got one, my boss, and, and I shared this with her before she gave me the last one. She goes, you're not leaving my office until you read this. Wow. And I was like, oh. And I actually read it, and I was like, wow. This is exact, the exact opposite of how I thought I performed. Ooh. Yeah. And there's it was a good, smile, of so it must be really good, right? Yeah, and, and, so, <laughs> and what, what's interesting is I never really read all the other ones before it. So I went back and like read through all of them. Like I should have been reading these things all along. Wow, <laughs> amazing. So Thank you for it, sharing It changed that. My, the way I perceived myself professionally. Wow. Okay. Who else has been avoiding reading their reviews? <laughs> It's like half hands, people are kind of hiding their hands. Yeah, th but this is a good experience, right, where maybe in the review, um, and somebody up here had mentioned during, during the breakout session that uh, you know, th they would get a lot of really positive feedback, but there's like one bad one, and that's the only one that they want to talk to and about during the review with their boss, right? Yeah, lots of head nods, who, who does that? Yeah, and it's because, you know, it's a thing that sticks out in your mind. Uh, human minds are wired to, to focus on the negative. Um, and what I would say to that is that, you know, to embrace all the positive, and if you are going into the review and you're looking to strategically get a raise or promotion, what should you be focusing on? The 27 things that are good or the one thing that's bad? The good stuff. Yeah, so hopefully as you're going into your reviews and thinking about this, you're framing it in that way. Yeah. Any other discoveries? There's somebody right behind you. Yeah. Uh, I noticed how it was really a cycle that keeps repeating um, with the two things, like all stemming from that unworthiness feeling where, you know, a lot of your time and your energy and resources are tapped by the thoughts and all the things going through your head dealing with unworthiness. So then it causes you to procrastinate because you don't feel like you're worthy and like you, you can't do a good enough job, but then of course you have to, so then you're doing it in a reactive way uh, when you do, and that's when perfectionism kicks in because you waited and then you're reactively trying to do these things, but you need to do it perfectly. So then, but you can't because you spent all that time <laughs> and you're doing it last minute. Uh, and so then you don't perform perfectly in your head and then it kicks right back into uh, the procrastination again because you're feeling unworthy and down on yourself. And so it just like keeps repeating, yeah. you yeah. can get stuck in yeah. it. Thank you for sharing that with Nicole, right? Um, yeah, it becomes like a negative loop, right? The negative thought, then you don't want to do it, and then you're feeling really stressed, and then you put yourself in a bad position because now you don't have time, and then it just refeeds itself. And so that's really great that you're talking about that because one of the strategies that we'll talk about at the end to set yourself up for success is that awareness and how do you combat that. So we'll go into that a little bit towards the end. Um, I'm going to take a little, one more comment in the back, um, but in the interest of time, that will probably be our last comment. So who wants the last comment? Okay. Big volunteer. Hi, I'm Smaya. Um, so for me, uh, one particular example that I can actually think of is right when I, so I'm a 
Callum. So I graduated from Berkeley and right off my undergrad, um, I was applying for jobs and I had only applied to four jobs. And then I was like, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I was like, I can't possibly. And I was thinking about all the different kinds of jobs I was applying to. And I was only applying to the jobs that I felt like I could just do. Mm. I was comfortable. I applied to four. I didn't apply to any more because I was like, okay, well, if I apply to a tech giant, I would probably get rejected because, A, I haven't discovered a Berkeley element or I haven't started my own NGO. So possibly I can't stand out, you know? I'm just a Berkeley graduate. And so I had this, like, one singular identity that I kind of, like, defined myself as and I limited myself. And, like, now I have a job that, you know, that, you know, that I'm proud of, but I'm not exactly feel like I'm not really utilizing my true potential. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like I'm doing something that is safe, that puts a roof over my head, pays my rent. But I always try to think about it. You know, I'm, I'm constantly, like, at my job, I'm reading blogs, I'm, I'm listening to podcasts, and I'm trying to utilize my resources, and I'm like, wow, this sounds very motivational. But I just want to go home and eat dinner. Like, <laughs> you know, so that's just kind of like that vicious cycle that you go through on a daily basis where you're just like, okay, well, that sounds cool. I'll get back because I'm hungry. You know, like, so that is just kind of like what I go through, and I would define as, like the imposter syndrome for myself. Yeah, well, thank you so much for sharing so candidly and vulnerably with that. Um, who, who can relate to that where you feel like, you know what, I have so much, but I'm just gonna let it pass. Yeah, that is a very common response, right? You, you feel like you have a lot to offer um, and you do have a lot to offer, but because of this feeling like you're not enough, you're, not, you're likely gonna get rejected anyways, why bother trying? Humans are wired to do things that have a payoff and a benefit. And so if there isn't an immediate payoff or immediate benefit, then the, the idea is like, you know what, Let, let's not do it. Um, so, so we've spent a lot of time on how it's negatively impacted you. And I want to transition into like, well, what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? How to build a champion mindset. And we talked about this a little bit earlier um, of having this idea of awareness. Before you came to this workshop, how many of you were aware that you had experienced imposter syndrome? It's like half the room. And now that you're at this workshop, how many of you are aware that you have imposter syndrome? <laughs> more. They're like laughing more. And you're like, shoot, I developed a new thing. No. <laughs> um, but as we said, over 70% you know, plus people are, are experiencing this. And then, and then how many of you beat yourself up for, for thinking these thoughts? It's like almost the whole room. And, and that's what feeds into this negative loop, right? So the strategy behind that is acceptance. Because what you resist persists. Where you pay your attention to will grow, right? So if you're constantly paying attention to the negative stuff and then beating yourself up for the negative stuff, guess what happens? It just gets bigger and bigger bigger. Let's do it together. It just gets bigger. Let's do it. Bigger. Yeah. And what you want to do is to like make it smaller, right? Make it smaller. Um, and so what we want to do now is to, to focus on new stories and beliefs and action that we're taking. So some of the stories that were shared were, you know, I'm never applying for jobs, but I'm just listening to motivational things. So let's change that. Another story that was shared was I never uh, read my reviews. Let's change that. So what we want to have is what I call your superpower story. A time to where you felt like, you know what, I couldn't achieve this, I don't qualify, I don't belong, but you were able to overcome that and to get to that feeling of that moment because that's what you need to ignite yourself. So every time this imposter syndrome thoughts come up, all the negative stuff, you're gonna listen to it, accept it, you know, you don't have to reject it or be mean about it, but Beyond that, what you want to do then is replace it with some new stories that you can tell yourself so that as you're moving forward in your life and your career, that's where you're spending more of your time. Get it? Cool. So let's spend a couple minutes just thinking or writing about a story that you feel, you know what, when I hear that story about myself, it just makes me feel like I'm Wonder Woman. Okay? A few minutes for that. <laughs> Would anybody like to share with the audience what, what came up? in your discussion in terms of stories that you can tell yourself and how to build this champion mindset? Okay, question, yes. So if you develop a new story or belief, that create another like 
another personality of yourself because I couldn't have a story. If, if Sunday, if I know I'm like I got cold. Oops, sorry about that. Say no, the cold supposed to be drinking water. No, no, drinking alcohol. Just like create another like belief, create another like personality. I don't think that's a way to fix my. So the question is, okay, how does the story actually help fix the situation? Great question, totally valid question. This is not something that you're gonna fix overnight, right? Because like this is a lifetime. How many of you have like experienced these thoughts since like you were really young? <laughs> like everybody in this room. <laughs> you're not gonna fix it overnight. But what studies does show is this: is that it's very hard to break a habit. Um, it's much easier to start a new habit. And so what we want to do is to introduce a new habit. So instead of focusing on, I suck, I'm a fraud, I don't belong, I should just die, my life is over, right? You know, <laughs> what we want to focus on is there's got to be at least one good story, something good that's happened in your life, either in your career or in your personal life or somewhere. And it doesn't have to be work-related necessarily, but it's like, you know, you accomplished something that you thought was never possible, that you didn't even want to try. And that is the story that you want to focus your attention on because in doing so, that allows you to build new neuron synapses in your brain to say, I can do it. And so it's that balance over time, right, as you're combating and managing the negative stuff by accepting it, by being aware of it, you're also at the same time working proactively to actually manage it and transition it into something more positive. Okay? There was a comment here. I saw a hand raise over here. To share, yes. Pass this to her. Um, so we both we had a really interesting situation in our group where um, two of us had the exact same experience, where Ooh. we were in situations that were really super toxic, and started to internalize that and started to question whether or not we should be in our respective professions. Um, and then I persevered and got to our next job and um, got the validation from new bosses. So for the bosses in the room, you have power. <laughs> um, so now we're getting all this new validation from our colleagues and we feel more in place. And so we're both sort of working on, like Charlene here is working on um, her last bit of imposter syndrome. She's identified a little quadrant that still exists. And, um, and then I'm, I'm working on internalizing success and not being like, oh, no, no, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me. It's, not, it's just everything else is why that was successful. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it was cool. Thank you for sharing that. Sometimes, you know, our outside uh, uh, factors do impact us, right? And the key is, like, what are we internalizing? Are you internalizing the negative stuff? Or are you internalizing the positive stuff? And that's really at the heart of imposter syndrome. There was a comment here. Would, yeah. Oh, Mike, yes, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for bringing up the habit um, aspect. Um, in, in my conversations, we were having trouble identifying even the, any of those stories. Like, I mean, because I don't have the habit of making them because they feel not real or not, you know, it feels like this is not, I'm making a story about somebody that isn't real. So mm. I, I appreciate that you brought up the habits, but I, what do you, how can, what advice do you have if, there are challenges even identifying those stories. Great, uh, great question. What was your name again? Alyssa. Melissa? Alyssa. 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 That's a great question. You know, um, I, I think if you're not in the habit of uh, building positive stories, of course it would be hard to find. So you might need to spend some time on it. Another thing you could do is ask a friend or a family member who knows you better. Um, and I'll share a story about a client, um, you know, uh, that last client that I talked about, you know, where she was looking and applying for jobs or not ever applying for jobs, right? And for her, it was really this idea that, that she was never going to get a job anyway, so why bother trying? And for her, we had to really dig into success in terms of like, well, when was a time that you were actually successful? She had to take this exam in China and did really well and got to the number one university in China. So that was a story, a moment where she felt extremely proud of her accomplishments because it's hard over there. It's not like here in America at all where, where their exams are a little different, right? Um, so you just have to dig deep into where in your life can you find a story that will support you. And as you start to build that habit, you'll be able to see more and more stories. The stories don't have to be like these huge grand things. They could be smaller things as well, right? A time where, you know, um, if, if you were getting a lot of negative comments uh, and feedback 
feedback about your work product, but there was one particular client where you worked with and you felt like, wow, I really made a difference. I helped that person you know, really achieve their goals or transform their lives. Those are the stories that you want to remind yourself of to start building this more positive uh, uh, mindset with yourself. Yeah. Yes. One more. One more comment, and then we're going to move on to the next topic. Yeah. So one thing that I shared with my colleague, Miguel, and we were talking about how do we motivate ourselves to mm -hmm. kind of jump into that next thing we want to do. Um, my, for me personally, I moved here across the country to pursue my master's degree. And I had grown up in the Midwest, uh, was the, on, the only one in my family, youngest of five, to go to college. Um, and I, so I had no, nobody to kind of show me the ropes, right? Um, and I, so when I thought about like, oh, moving to San Francisco, I was scared out of my pants. Like, I was just like, how am I gonna do it? It's the most expensive place on earth, or one of them. Um, you know, like, how am I even gonna get a job? I'm sure there's many more qualified people out there than I am. Um, but then I thought about, you know, how I did my undergrad. I did it um, with the help of many people, but also myself, like having that willingness to, to do it, to become the first and to become an example and to mentor people as well. Um, and what I started to think about was not like the challenges that I was going to face moving here, but more the opportunities. Like I, I was really safe back home. I had a great network of friends and family um, and, and I thought about, okay, that's great, but I need to challenge myself. So I moved here and I thought about all the great friends that I would make, all of the growth I would go through. Um, and I, I would never turn back. I think it really has made me a better person. Um, and I'm looking forward to new challenges. I always think about what is the positive thing that's going to come out of that? Um, even though I'm scared, but acknowledging that you're scared is the first step. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I know there's a lot more comments, but we have very little time left. So um, I want to make sure we cover the material. And then, you know, if any of you want to talk to me or connect with me, I'll share a little bit about like, my contact information. And I'll be here after the session as well um, if you want to talk or ask questions. So how do we connect with our true desires? Um, we don't have as much time to, to talk through all of this, but this is just the first step, right? First is recognizing that, according to Gallup, 85% of people are either engaged or actively disengaged at work. Can you believe that? <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that's something to just acknowledge and, and know that, look, that's something that's going on right now, and it's a global phenomenon. It's not just in America. It's all over the world that people are disengaged. Um, and the next thing to do is to set intentions. If you know that you're at a place, like the, the woman who shared earlier, like, you know, I really want to do something else. I know how more potential. Then setting the intention of saying, I'm going to focus some energy on that. Um, and it doesn't have to be a lot. It could be a good five minutes. It could be a good 10 minutes. However, time, however much time you can start with, just to get yourself into that space of like, hey, every day I'm going to reconnect with myself and give myself that space. The next thing is creating space, right? If you don't calendar it, does it happen? No. So setting it in your schedule and saying, OK, this is the time I'm going to actually do this. It could be 20 minutes during my lunch break. It could be first thing I do 10 minutes when I wake up. For me, myself, I wake up and um, I meditate and I journal for like the first half hour of my day because it allows me to clear my energy and kind of set my intention for the day. And then the last thing is like following through with, with opportunities. How many of you have said, you know, that's a great idea, but then not, not follow through with it? So many of us, right? So if you keep doing the same thing, expecting different results, Einstein says that's crazy, <laughs> right? So what you need to do is to get yourself to a space where you're transitioning and shifting so that you're actually going to be in a place where you're setting yourself up for success. Um, so I only have a little bit of time, um, but I wanted to get a, a sense of um, you know, feedback on um, what were some of the takeaways you got out of this session. Yeah, go ahead. Five minutes, OK. Yes. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Hello. Um, so 
it was really great to be in a room with a bunch of other people who have imposter syndrome, especially because yeah! like, you feel like you're the only one. And then it also helped me, like because of imposter syndrome, I have a little bit of the perfectionism and I also expect a lot from other people because I expect so much from myself. And it gave me more compassion for like, oh, well, what if the person on the other end is like on the like procrastination end of it and it'll help me you know, be more understanding with my colleagues and myself. Yeah, wonderful. Compassion is such a great thing. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. I feel like this is a good uh, add-on to that, which is I just want to say to a room full of people who work at UC Berkeley that my imposter syndrome comes from the fact that I went to a crappy school. <laughs> right? <laughs> and it's yeah, and... Uh, and, you know, I guess I just tell myself, well, I'm here, aren't I? You know, all y'all went to Cal. I went to the University of South Florida, which is not even in South Florida. <laughs> and I took almost six years to get a creative writing degree. So, I mean, I don't know. My imposter syndrome is, it's, it's a self-defeating or self-fixing prophecy. Yeah. And yet you're the co-chair of the Facilitators Network, right? So, yeah. And going on what she said... I never even got a high school diploma, so I'm a GED baby right here. It's like a confessional in here. <laughs> um, yeah, but what I want to say is that it's been really great to hear all of your stories and see how engaged and active you are. Um, it's amazing that the university has set this up for you um, and that you're here fully participating, because it could have been easy to just come in this room and say, like, that's not me, or... I'm not going to share because I'm worried about what other people are going to think about me. And hopefully what, what you see in this room is that, you know, by acknowledging it, recognizing it, giving it some space, and then really thinking through so that you're actually having a way to proactively manage it, it'll be better for your career and for your life overall. If you want to contact me for questions, or if some of you have questions about, um, uh, you know, that you want to talk about your career, you want a complimentary coaching session, I'm happy to, to provide that. My email is samorn at careerunicorns.com. I am doing a couple coaching sessions here, but I know it's very limited here, so feel free to reach out to me, and I'd be happy to um, schedule a time to talk to you. Um, you can also get my guide, Turn Your Career from Dread to Joy, at www.careerunicorns.com. Um, it's been amazing to be here and um, I hope you have a great rest of your conference and if you have questions I'll be up here. Thank you. Thank you.